thank you very much for coming. So yeah, it'll be a bit different than a normal CIC lecture. I'm going to do a shorter format, 20 to 30 minutes. So without further ado, I am Lonnie Kubo, and I'm going to be presenting the content of my thesis entitled The Effects of Prenatal Exposure to THC on Brain Development in Mice. So pregnant people are increasingly using cannabis. What this graph shows is between 2009 to 2016, we looked at the, they looked at the <laughs> adjusted prevalence of cannabis use in pregnant people. And in the dark gray line on the top, we see that the use has been increasing from about 4% in the earlier study, all the way up to seven and a half or 8% by the end of this time period. What this graph also shows is in blue, we see positive toxicology. So from actual biological samples, as opposed to an orange positive self-report. And most of the studies that try to assess prevalence of cannabis use in pregnancy do use self-report. Uh, and this suggests they could be underestimating the um, effects or the amount of use that there is. And this is important because prenatal cannabis exposure and specifically prenatal THC exposure can impact neurodevelopment. In this schematic, we see mouse gestation all the way from embryonic day zero on the far left to through birth, roughly gestational day 19.5 or 20 in the mouse to adulthood. And what you can see in the shaded and pale pink is the levels of the two major endocannabinoids, 2-AG and anandamide, or AEA. And these are very tightly regulated during the course of development. What 2-AG starts at very low levels and increases slowly, whereas it's an anandamine starts high but experiences a very sharp drop-off, which is, which is necessary for implantation to occur. And so we're specifically looking at what's roughly equivalent to the first trimester in humans early in pregnancy. And we can see on the bottom that the endocannabinoid system plays an important role in lots of different types of processes that are critical for neurodevelopment. So early on, it plays a role in fertilization and implantation, as well as the development of neuronal progenitors. And then later in pregnancy, it also plays a role in neuron migration, morphogenesis of cells, and axon guidance. And the reason we're talking about mice is because they allow for a studies that are on an accelerated neurodevelopmental time course in comparison to humans. So here above the gray line, we see a mouse uh, time course from embryonic day 9.5 to uh, postnatal day 90 or young adulthood. And in humans, this same time course could take 20 to 30 years to assess. So it would be a career's worth of work to understand what some insults such as prenatal cannabis exposure might have on the lifespan. And for an urgent question like this, the mice provide a useful model that we can use. At the same time, there are certain limitations to using a model, any model. And in this case, two things we can see are that some of the hallmark processes involved in neurodevelopment are on offset time courses. So up above in purple, you can see programmed cell death begins prenatally in the mouse, but on the bottom, it's almost completely in the prenatal or in utero period in humans. Likewise, myelination occurs prenatally in humans, but almost entirely postnatally in, mouse, in the mouse. And so there are certain limitations in trying to understand how these time courses compare across the different species. So my major research questions over the course of my thesis was what impact does PTE have on trajectories of brain development across the lifespan? And I started looking in utero, then during the first two weeks of life, and finally until adulthood in three separate cohorts of mice. And to answer this question, my primary assay is small mag animal magnetic resonance imaging or structural MRI. And there's a couple of main benefits to using a technique like this. First of all, it allows for us to do longitudinal experiments within these mice. It's a non-invasive assay, so we can assess mice multiple times across their lifespan and really develop trajectories of development rather than looking cross-sectionally and only getting a snapshot of a single time point. Secondly, it's highly translatable because it can be used in humans and it can be used in human children and neonates, which is one of the few assays that we can really use like that. And finally, it allows us to look at the entire brain rather than pre-selecting a region of interest, which might make us blind to certain regions that aren't often studied or are often overlooked. And it also can give us a sense of what's happening on the systems level. So I have some common methodologies across these experiments to allow me to understand the effects across the lifespan. 
So first of all, we injected five milligrams per kilogram of THC from gestational days three to 10 in the dams. In the first experiment, we extracted the embryos on gestational day 17 and, and imaged them ex vivo. In the second experiment, we had the exact same administration paradigm, but the pups were born, and then we imaged them on postnatal day three, five, seven, and 10. On postnatal day 12, we collected ultrasonic vocalizations, which are calls that the pups make when they're separated from the dams. And this can be a measure of social behavior in these early life time points. And then in the final experiment, again, we had the same administration paradigm. We also incorporated some measures of the maternal behavior. And then the pups were born and weaned, and we imaged them on postnatal day 25, 35, 60, and 90. And at, a, at an adolescent time point, we uh, collected two behaviors open field test for anxiety-like behaviors and pre-pulse inhib inhibition for sensory motor gating. And so I also had some common methods on, the, on, on our outcome side. So from here on, project one is the embryos, project two is the neonates, and project three is this adolescent to adulthood time point that I'm referring to as adults. But we acquired a measure of either the body volume in the embryos or the pup weight and weight gain later in life. And then we looked at structural MRI and the brain volume across all three experiments. And we included the behavioral assays in the second two experiments. And the hallmark of the work that we've been doing with the structural MRI is incorporating the deformation-based morphometry to understand the changes in the brains following the prenatal exposure. And so most of you are familiar with this, I know, but in case there's some of you who aren't, if we have two mouse brains, say we have mouse brain one, which has a larger region in the cortex, and mouse brain two that has a smaller region. In order to uh, statistically model these differences, what we do is we register the brains together to put them into a common space, and then we can map changes back from the, co the common space to each of the individual brains. And this allows us to understand regions that had to decrease to meet the average or increase to meet the average on a voxel-wise level. And these voxel-wise values are known as Jacobian determinants. And then we can model them in my thesis, I use mass univariate linear mixed effects models in order to understand the group-wise differences. So that's a cross-sectional version, but because we have multiple time points for each subject and the second two experiments, we use the two-level version of this so if we have four scans for subject one, we first create a subject-wise average, and we do this for each of the averages or each of the subjects, and then we create a population average from these subject averages. And the Jacobians are modeled in each subject, and then they're transformed into the final space. So moving into project one, here I studied the impact of chronic prenatal exposure to THC early in gestation on brain volume of mouse embryos. This is my sample size following the correction, all my quality controls. And one thing that you'll note is we have something called the null group. So that's a group where I restrained the dams but did not inject them. And that was to control the potential effects of the chronic injections. And so, yeah, we started with 14 males and females per group. And so first, we had the entire body of these embryos. So we first did an entire body DBM, which allowed us to assess their, the volume of the embryo as a whole. But then we also did a DBM on just the brain in order to optimize the contrast in the brain. And so here we're looking at the impact of the prenatal THC exposure on the volume of the embryos. So on the x-axis, we have the treatment. Saline is purple, null is blue, and THC is green. That'll always be the case in these. And on the y-axis, we have the body volume. And the first thing we note is that there is a significant difference between the saline and null groups, such that the saline is a bit smaller than the null group. And then there's further a reduction in the volume of the THC group compared to the saline group. And so this is consistent with intrauterine growth restriction or fetal growth restriction, which has also been demonstrated. It's one of the most ubiquitous effects in the prenatal cannabis literature. It also introduces a bit of an interesting problem for me because here we see a relationship between the THC exposure and the weight, or the, in this case, the volume. And I want to study the impact of the THC exposure on the brain volume. But we can also assume that there will be a relationship, or there could be a relationship, between the volume of the entire embryo and the volume of the brain. But these two are collinear, so I can't just include the weight or the, the embryo volume in the model as a covariate. 
So instead, I take an approach known as mediation with residuals, where we extract the residuals from this model and incorporate it as a covariate in our linear mixed effect model, looking at brain volume. And so here, this heat map shows the main effect of the THC exposure compared to the saline controls. It's been corrected for multiple comparisons with the false discovery rate from 5%. And so here, every region that is a warm color indicates a larger volume in the THC pup compared to the saline control. Every region that's blue is sm a relatively smaller volume. And one of the most striking things we can see here is this bilateral pattern of ventricular megaly that follows the, ventri the lateral ventricle very clearly. And so we can plot some peak voxels here. Again, we have the same color scheme as before, so you can see the green is slightly higher without a difference between the null and the saline groups in this case. We also see a larger volume in the caudic putamen and the corpus callosum. And these results are particularly interesting because they do line up with some preliminary results in some other studies looking at prenatal cannabis exposure in humans and non-human animals. And then we see some regions also show this smaller volume in the embryos, such as the motor cortex and the amygdala. So in summary from this first project, we saw intrauterine growth restriction associated with ventricular megaly, as well as some other regional changes. This brings me to project two, where we studied, I studied the impact of chronic prenatal exposure to THC early in gestation on trajectories of development in neonatal mice. And here is my sample size following quality control. And so again, we see that there is an impact of THC on the weights of the pups this time, but we see it actually impacts the growth rate. So in over the first two weeks of life, we see this characteristic catch-up effect such that the THC mice overtake the growth rate of the saline controls. And this has been de demonstrated in a couple of other studies looking at intrauterine growth restrictions. It also brings up the idea that, again, we have this collinearity problem. And so I, again, take the mediation with residuals approach. So this time what we're looking at is the THC by age effect in the neonates, thresholded from 5% to 1%. And so in this case, blue doesn't necessarily just mean a smaller volume. These pups are growing, their brains are increasing over time. However, relative to the saline control, in these bilateral regions across the brain, we see a very clear signature of a decreased growth rate. And so we can see that more particularly in, for example, the right hippocampus, where we see that initially they don't seem to differ much, but we see this fall off in the growth rate of the THC pups. And this is consistent with reach pretty much every region we plot the uh, peak voxel for. I should note also in neither of these two studies did we see an effect interacting with the sex of the pup. So it's pretty interesting that we see this pronounced THC effect. To look at the impact of the prenatal THC exposure on the ultrasonic vocalizations, we took a slightly different approach. For example, and if you were canonically to study something like this, you might just look at the length of calls that the pups are making with a T-test or an ANCOVA. Instead, we adapted or we used the shift function, which allows us to understand differences in the distributions of data, not only whether there's this overarching difference. And so here we divided the groups up by both their condition as well as their sex in order to start to continue to assess this sex by treatment interaction. So at the top, here we have on the x-axis the call length in milliseconds. And on the y-axis, we have each of our four groups, male THC, male saline, female THC, and female saline. The bars indicate the, de indicate the deciles of these data, and the dark bar indicates the median. So then with the shift function, we can actually compare these distributions pairwise to understand whether there are differences in how the data are distributed. So first, what we're looking at here is the deciles for the female saline on the x-axis and the difference between the female saline and the female THC on the y-axis. So each of the dots indicates the decile differences. The fact that it's a positive curve indicates that the female saline are making longer calls than the female THC, and wherever the confidence intervals do not cross zero indicates that that is a significantly different difference, significantly different difference. So what we see here is that the female saline group is making more longer calls than the female THC group. When we compare the female saline and male saline group, we see that across the entire distribution, the males are actually making uh, fewer calls than the females. And then when we look at the male saline versus the male THC group, 
we see that the male THC animals are making more longer calls than the male saline animals. So canonically, more calls is indica indicative of an anxiety-like phenotype. At the same time, fewer calls has also been interpreted as impairments to this calling behavior, which is adaptive. And so I don't want to overinterpret this too much, but I think it is worth noting that we do seem to see this sex effect that's emerging in the social behavior of these pups early on. And so we see this characteristic catch-up effect in the weight. We see a decreased growth rate in the brain volume, and we see this emergence of sex effects in this altered social behavior early on. This brings me to project three, which investigates the long-term impact of chronic prenatal exposure to THC early in gestation on the trajectories of development and behavior. And so here is my sample size following quality control for this study. And so again, we see an impact of the prenatal THC exposure on the weight of the pups, but this time we see that the THC pups weight falls off and is reduced compared to the saline controls. And so again, we use the mediation with residuals approach to incorporate the residuals from this model into our brain model. And so here, what we're looking at this time is the main effect of the THC. So no age effect in this, and it's threshold from 10%, so a little bit less significant. But what this indicates overall is that there's these regions that show that this initial fall off in growth rate is a sustained reduction in volume, not necessarily interacting with time though. And so if we plot some peak fossils, for example, in the right caudate putamen, on the left, you may be able to see that there is this pronounced reduction uh, of the entire line. So it's a smaller volume over the time, of course, but that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, that's the females. In the males, we also see that there isn't really so much of a difference. And this is also uh, consistent with a sex by treatment interaction that we see thresholded from 5% to 1%. And so we can see this is actually true for a lot of regions throughout the brain, where we see this pronounced continuation of that decrease in the curve for the females but to some degree, a normalization in the males. Looking at the open field test results, we measured a couple of different things. So first of all, we looked at the total distance moved by these animals in the arena. And so we saw a sex effect, a THC effect, and an interaction between the two, such that the THC and the females were, making, were moving less overall. When we looked at time spent in the center, we saw a THC effect and a trending interaction. And then when we looked at the passes they made through the center of the arena, we saw a THC effect and the interaction. And after I corrected for Bonferroni, the main effect of THC was still significant, which suggests to me that we see, are seeing an anxiety-like phenotype in the THC mice, potentially more so in the females. So in summary of these projects overall, we see that PTE impacts the embryo volume early on, such that it's consistent with intrauterine growth restriction. And while we see a catch-up effect in the first two weeks of life, it does seem that by adolescence, these lines are switching such that the THC mice actually have a fall off in that in their, in their growth overall. And that is consistent with some more recent literature that looks at prenatal cannabis exposure. When we look at the brain volume, we see this initial ventricular megaly followed by a decrease in the growth rate across the brain and a sustained reduction of the volume, especially in the females. And there are some consistently affected regions across different experiments. So in across all three experiments, we see the caudate putamen, thalamus, and olfactory bulbs, as well as the cerebellum, corpus callosum, and amygdala, and the medulla and the hypothalamus affected. In the first two experiments, we see alterations to the ventricles, and in the second two experiments, we see alterations in the hippocampus. And then we see these sex differences emerging early on in behaviors and continuing into adulthood. So this work presents several scientific contributions to the PTE literature. First, we show that PTE impacts the weight across the lifespan. We also show that PTE induces an early increase in local brain regions, especially the ventricles, followed by a reduced growth rate that persists until adulthood. We show that sex effects only emerge after puberty in the brain results, although they seem to emerge earlier in the behavioral results. And then we see that social behavior is altered in the neonates and anxiety-like behavior seems present in adolescents. This work also generates some hypotheses for future studies. So regions of interest from the MRI results could be used to focus postmortem assays. We could also computationally model the spread of how the brain changes uh, across different networks. 
and there's the potential to translate the structural results from animals into human work. And potentially in time, this work could contribute to some broader implications for the literature, for example, informing recommendations for cl clinicians and pregnant people and highlighting critical periods of risk for pediatricians. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, the wonderful members of my lab for all their support over the years, as well as the Douglas Animal Care staff and the members of my committee. Thank you. <laughs> and if you all have any other questions, you can email me any other questions or come and stop by. I'm happy to take them all. <laughs>